Uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Ten Ten Slam series organized by Air Lab, led by the Professor Swat Shear, and uh, Robot uh, Perception Lab, led by the Professor Michael Kiss at the CMU Robotics Institute. My name is Shiva. I'm the PhD student in Carnegie Mellon University, and I will be the host for this presentation. Today, Professor Daniel Primers will join us and talk about deep and direct visual slam. Daniel is a professor of informatics and mathematics and the chair of the computer vision and artificial intelligence at the Technical University of Munich. In 2002, he obtained a PhD in computer science from the University of Mannheim, Germany. He is also served as an area chair associate editor for the SCCV, ECCV, CVPR, and Actual. His publication received several awards, including the best paper of the year 2003 and the Olympic Award 2004. According to the Google Scholar, Professor Kramers has an H index of 101, and his paper have been cited more than 48,000 times. He is also co-founder of the several companies, most recently the high-tech startup artisans. Professor Daniel Kramers' research lies in the computer vision, machine learning, deep networks, convex and combinatorial optimization, and uh, mathematic image analysis and actual. We are thrilled to have Professor Daniel Krimers join us today and uh, looking forward to the fun talk. The floor is all yours, Professor Krimers. Welcome to the Professor Krimers. Thank you. Thank you, Shibo. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, and to contribute to this really wonderful uh, talk series or presentation series that you put together. Um, and the work that I'm presenting today is called Deep and Direct Visual Slam, and uh, it's been mostly done by current and former students of mine, in particular Nan Yang, Lucas von Stumberg, Rui Wang, Felix Wimbauer, and Jacob Engel. And so the work that I'm presenting has really been done mostly by these five uh, people. Um, before I go into this work, maybe a few more words about myself. Uh, my main job um, is to head the TUM Computer Vision Group, uh, and this is a fairly large group with quite a number, as you can see, of PhD students, also postdocs, working on a range of uh, research challenges in the field of computer vision, machine learning, optimization, shape analysis. So it's, it's quite a broad spectrum of research topics that we work on uh, and a little bit too much to really go into any detail on any of these topics. Although I think especially for this series and also for the team of Michael Case and, and the involved labs, there is uh, interesting work that uh, one could mention. Here's, for example, uh, one fairly recent paper that is somewhat related to the Square Root Sam paper of uh, Michael and Frank Dellart. Uh, it's called Square Root Bundle Adjustment for Large Scale Reconstruction. Uh, this was a paper at uh, CVPR uh, this year where we tackle large scale bundle adjustment. And then there's a follow up this week at ICCV where we extend this to sliding window bundle adjustment. Uh, um, and uh, th these works may be interesting. The key idea here, in at least in, in the CVPR space, the paper, is that, um, <clears throat> that we make use of the concept of null space marginalization of the landmark variables by QR decomposition. Uh, the key problem being that when you do bundle adjustment, as most of you know, you typically deal with millions of variables. Uh, um, um, and, and the challenge is to, in particular, um, um, get rid of the, the landmark uh, variables because these are a large number. And traditionally, this is done by the Schur complement trick, as most of you know. What we show in this paper is that the Schur complement trick can be replaced by this uh, uh, null space marginalization, uh, which is algebraically equivalent, but numerically significantly more stable so that you can run uh, the, the problem, for example, on simple floating point architecture and can easily port it to things like the GPU. But even on the CPU, we found that our solution uh, is 42% uh, faster than the best competing methods to reach a certain level of precision on very large bundle adjustment problems. And as I said this week, ICCV is a follow-up where we show that these techniques can also be 
uh, apply to sliding window approaches. Uh, and if you're interested, Nico Demmel, the lead author, will be presenting it. We had one session, I think, last night, and another one is tomorrow. So feel free to, to stop by. I think, I think he'd be happy because with these online conferences, sometimes no one shows up. And, <laughs> and then it's a bit of a pity for all the effort that we put in. So this is just a short advertisement because this is not what I'll be talking about today. For this talk, I decided to focus on deep and direct visual slam and visual odometry. Um, uh, and there's four parts. So first I'll talk about direct slam, what we mean by direct slam, what the key novelty there is, the key idea. Then I'll talk a little bit about how to deploy this for autonomous systems like self-driving cars or autonomous robots flying or driving robots. And in the second part, I will look into how can we leverage the power of deep networks to boost the performance of in, in this field of SLAM. And I think this is possibly most interesting to many people because deep learning, as you know, has revolutionized our world. But still to date for topics like 3D reconstruction and SLAM, there's still to some extent an open challenge how to make them work. So let's start at the very beginning. SLAM is a very long standing problem. Uh, in fact, it was much older than I would have thought. Uh, this is an Austrian mathematician by the name of Erwin Krupa. And as some of you know, more than 100 years ago, he proved this seminal result where he showed that if you observe five corresponding points in two camera images, then you can recover the relative motion of the camera between the two frames and the 3D location of these points. And this was quite an achievement at the time. I think in particularly, uh, it, it, it's interesting because this was done way before the advent of computers, right? So at the time in this field of photogrammetry, people would mark these corresponding points in photographs manually, say the church tower here, the church tower there, et cetera. And once you have sufficient number of corresponding pairs of points, then you can compute camera motion and 3D location of these points, right? This is all great. And in fact, then in the subsequent uh, years, uh, let's say in the 60s, 60s, 70s, 80s, the vision community set out and developed algorithms often called structure from motion to, to put this into a machine, to make a machine reconstruct camera motion and 3D structure. And uh, many of you know the history. I don't want to go too much into detail, but some of the first real-time capable structure for motion or visual slam as it's now often called methods. Some of the first real-time capable ones appeared uh, um, around 2000. One should say if you really go into detail, some people would argue that structure for motion and slam, visual slam are not exactly the same problem. So there's different variants depending on, on how you formalize the problem, but I don't want to go too much into terminology. Um, um, but it's important to know the relationships because often people think that visual slam is the topic and then they don't find the old structure for motion papers. I think one of the first uh, real-time structure for motion approaches uh, was demonstrated in Stefano Suato's lab at UCLA around 2000. Uh, at least when I joined the lab in 2002, the old demo was a bit dusted up, but still working, so I know it was there. And then this is just a few kind of selected works from real-time structure from motion or real-time visual slam. This is, you could say, a random selection because there is obviously far more work uh, in, the, in the community, also in, in your teams. Um, but these are works that had the significant impact. For example, the PTAM is a popular technique, Klein and Moray, parallel tracking and mapping but also Andy Davison and, and uh, Richard Newcomb's DTAM and uh, many, many other approaches. A lot of these traditional approaches are very much following in the footsteps of Krupa. So basically, and these are techniques that we call key point based techniques. 
They follow in the Krupa's footsteps in the sense that they, they take two images. Krupa said, we need two images. Then they extract points because Krupa said, we need points. And then since Krupa said, we need corresponding point pairs, they put a lot of effort into identifying corresponding points across images. And this is essentially where most of these descriptors like SIFT, SURF, BRIEF, you name it, and even deep learning based descriptors were developed for the purpose of identifying corresponding points in multiple images. The fact that so many descriptors were developed already shows you this is not an easy problem. And in fact, no matter which descriptors you use, you will never get perfect correspondences. And so you typically, as you know, have to revert to techniques like um, a ransack to resample correspondences to hopefully find the right ones, etc. But invariably, this technique is, is bound to be suboptimal for many reasons. First of all, uh, in these uh, key point based techniques, at the moment when you extract points from an image, you throw away lots of potentially valuable brightness information from your sensor, right? And in some sense, you, you, when you do the optimization by minimizing this reprojection error, say with bundle adjustment, for example, then you're not working on the raw sensory data. And so invariably from a statistical, say Bayesian inference point of view, your solutions will never be optimal because you, you create an intermediate abstraction and at that point you throw away potentially valuable information. But even more so once you, uh, you know, associate correspondences across points, any errors you make in assigning correspondence will propagate and deteriorate your reconstructions. And this is why uh, we've been advocating as an alternative to the key point based techniques, so-called direct slam method. And as shown here, they skip this intermediate abstraction step and go straight from the raw sensory data from the brightness values of your camera stream to a reconstruction of camera motion and 3D structure. And the idea is actually quite simple. You essentially say, find a camera motion uh, and a 3D structure of the world such that once I project the brightness values into the world and out into the next camera, they should be consistent. And so the thing that drives the whole inference is brightness consistency. And so in contrast to key point based methods, we don't minimize a geometric reprojection error of points in the image, but we minimize a photometric color consistency error to infer camera motion and 3D map. Let me go more into detail about this. This was one of the, the possibly most influential works in this line of research, uh, a technique uh, called LSD SLAM, a uh, large scale direct SLAM. It's become very popular over the last years. Uh, this is an overview of the method. It starts on the top left with an input video streaming in at 30 Hertz. And then there's two threads that are that run in alternation. One is a tracking thread that estimates the camera motion. And one is a depth map estimation step that predicts steps that generates depth maps for each keyframe. And the thing that makes it large scale is a technique that we adopted from LIDAR based SLAM, uh, namely a pose graph optimization that creates a globally consistent uh, trajectory of the camera where pairwise alignments uh, are, are generated in a way that they're globally consistent. Um, but, but what makes this direct? Let's look into the tracking component here where we track the motion of the camera. These are six parameters, rigid body motion, right? So we call this rigid body motion G Xi. Xi are the six parameters of translation and rotation. And here you see the loss function we employ to do it. We have a current image and some keyframe image that we compare to. And then for each pixel X in the keyframe, we say the brightness of the keyframe should be the same as the corresponding point, the brightness of the corresponding point in the new image I. And how do we get there? Well, we multiply with the inverse steps U that gets us into the 3D world. Then we rotate and translate with the GXI into the new coordinates of the new frame. And then we have a perspective back projection pi into the new camera. And then these brightnesses should be the same for all pixels. And so you see here in this integration over the image plane omega, 
all pixels equally cont contribute uh, to this estimate. In practice, we typically do a selection for speed and we take those points that have some uh, significant image gradient. But in principle, it means any kind of brightness variation in the image can will contribute to the inference. And since you only estimate six parameters uh, xi here, this can easily be done in a course to find linearization scheme uh, in something like a Gauss-Newton iteration. And, uh, and you can run that uh, on, on a single laptop CPU at even on a single core in real time. As you can see here, this is the alignment that's being computed. Here you see the whole system in action. Top left is the camera, Jacob Engel, the lead author is holding the camera here. And you see on the right how the camera is being tracked and on the fly, a large scale environment is being created. And I think at the time, this was the real breakthrough in terms of the scalability of this approach. There were approaches that could, like PTAM could recover a small desktop environment, but you could not take it outdoor and map the whole world here. You can take a single camera, move around the world, and in real time, the world emerges as a large scale reconstruction. And obviously, since this only takes a single camera, it works indoor or outdoor anywhere. It's not dense, as you can see, but uh, what Jacob calls semi-dense. So for typically 50% of the pixels, you have a depth value associated. And the whole approach is extremely robust. Uh, in fact, let me move on to say, for example, outliers to moving objects. It assumes a static world, but it can handle the dynamic environments as well. Um, uh, I'll move on to the next uh, approach. This is the follow-up or direct sparse odometry. Here we start with a single camera. Again, top left is the input. You see there are people walking through the scene, doesn't really matter. So it can have dynamic objects, but still it, as you can see, tracks the motion of the camera, just one single camera at very high precision. Over a very large sequence, you can walk through entire subway station and out on the other side. There are multiple differences here uh, to LSD SLAM, uh, um, but the main difference is that we jointly optimize, so not alternatingly, but jointly optimize camera motion and 3D structure uh, in a Gauss Newton optimization. And the way we get it to real time is that we do a sliding window version where typically for the last K keyframes, the, uh, the pose is being optimized uh, in real time. And then there is a marginalization over the older frames in the sequence. Obviously, once you track the camera in a real-time fashion, frame to frame, uh, you will create errors in the camera motion estimation. And these will aggregate into what, what's typically called a drift. Here, for example, you see the bicycle on the top left is actually reconstructed twice in, in the reconstruction. So there is an error, a drift of what maybe two or three meters, I'd say, on a walking distance of hundreds of meters. So you could say the total drift is, I would say, less than 1% of the distance moved. But this is a key question uh, for this work, but essentially for any work in computer vision today, how do you quantify performance of such methods, right? Because the issue being you want the methods to work in the real world, but you want to quantify how accurately do they work. And this is a challenge here because, uh, you know, in a room, we can deploy a mocap system and we've done that, obviously, but we cannot really deploy a mocap system in the whole city uh, to check the performance, uh, you know, in traffic and wherever you want to go. Right. So this is a bit of a challenge here. And, uh, and then you can move to simulated environments, right? But what we've consistently found in many, many experiments is that methods that work well in a simulated world often fail miserably when you take them to the real world. And then it's, you know, it's not often obvious to say why, because the simulations often look super photorealistic, right? except possibly they were generated with a perfect perspective camera model. And real cameras, sorry to say this, they don't have a perfect perspective camera model. 
and there's lots of photometric aspects of uh, and aperture changes and 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 you know all sorts of noise and non-lambertian structures in the scene that make the methods fail once you take them to the real world. And so what we did to really quantify performance in the real world, Jacob took lots of sequences, the ones you see here, actually uh, there's uh, uh, lots of different sequences uh, um, acquired in different environments with different motions, some more translation, some faster, some slower, some more rotation, some with perspective lenses, some with fish eye lenses. So we wanted to have really a broad coverage of, of application scenarios, right? Some indoor, some outdoor, etc. They're very diverse, but they all have one thing in common. They all, much like in the subway example, loop back to where they started from, which means that for all of these sequences, we have no clue where the camera is halfway through the sequence, but we do know where it should be at the very end. And so we can compute for each sequence a total drift in translation, in rotation, and in scale. And then we can plot, as you can see here, the total error in translation, rotation, and scale per sequence on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we plot the number of sequences where we've achieved that particular error. And obviously, you want to be in the top left corner in the sense that for as many sequences as possible, you want to have as small an error as possible. And here we compare to what is often considered the state of the art in real time visual slam, a technique called very powerful and uh, strong technique called orb slam from a team in Zaragoza. And uh, what, you, uh, what you see here is this is comparisons around 2017. So a lot of these curves in terms of uh, runtime would have shifted a little bit upwards, but at the time the dashed lines are the real time performing, solid is if you have a bit more compute. Uh, and you can read these plots in many ways, but they basically show that there is a significant improvement that we achieve through direct methods, through directly tapping into the brightness of the sensor rather than into, into a, a key point based abstraction. So for example, you can say, what is the error on the best 300 sequences? Orb slam has an error of six. We have an error of one in direct sparse odometry. Uh, or if you want to uh, bound the error and say, I, I want a maximum error of two, how many out of 500 sequences can I track with that error? Orb slam can track 100, we can track 400 out of 500. So also a significant boost in robustness. And note this is significant in the sense that this is not like a, a one or two or 5% improvement. No, this is almost, if you look at like a factor six improvement means you're almost one order of magnitude more accurate. So we thought, wow, if you can track a camera in real time at that level of precision and robustness, there must be a practical value for this. And so we created a startup company called Artisans, uh, which has offices in different places, but the main hub is in Munich. It's a company that currently hosts around 25 employees and uh, is focused on developing sensory systems, first of all, that have the optimal requirements in terms of calibration, synchronization, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, um, for example, global shutter cameras are, in our view, preferred to rolling shutter. Uh, but also Artisans advances the technologies uh, um, and, and, and really makes them applicable to the real world to bridge that gap from a research grade technology to really a commercial grade technology. We have a big car, as you saw on the previous slide. We also have toy cars where we can basically that we can equip with the same types of sensors, typically cameras, but also inertial sensors uh, and uh, RTK, GPS, and you name it. And then all that sensory information is fused to get optimal estimates. Here, for example, is a result of extending direct sparse odometry to stereo a work that was supported by artisans uh, as well, where we showed that you gain two things by extending it to two cameras. Once, since you have a known baseline, you actually get the scale of the world, which with classical methods from a single camera, you cannot. 
but also you significantly reduce the drift, create much more precision and robustness. And this is not surprising, the more sensory data you can fuse into these estimations, the more accurate and robust these methods tend to get. Right? So there's more videos on the net, I'll move forward in the interest of time. So sensory systems is one thing that Artisans does, but also the spatial AI processing of this sensory data to create accurate maps, to create localization information in real time. And beyond that, once you have 3D maps, you can do many things. As you know, the vision community has very much been focused on labeling images, detecting objects and images with deep networks in particular. But obviously, once you have these capabilities to reconstruct the world, it makes much more sense to start labeling the 3D world like you see here. So we can create large scale semantic maps where you can distinguish the drivable area, the sidewalks, the buildings, pedestrians, cyclists, vegetation, you name it, right? Everything that you can detect in images obviously directly translates to the 3D world once you have the capability to create the 3D world. The way we achieve this here is uh, artisans deploy their sensory systems on a whole fleet of cars. And so in a matter of no time, we could map 8,000 kilometers of coverage, pretty much entire towns, cities. And I think this can be useful for many purposes for autonomous driving to have a capability to create real-time 3D semantic maps of the world at very low cost because it's essentially just cameras, right? It doesn't need a LiDAR to do this. And in many ways, this is kind of a general message that I've been advocating for years now. As you know, uh, you know, there's lots of companies that are working fervently on creating self-driving cars. To date, for 3D perception, they largely rely on lighters. And I think this is not uh, the right thing to do. Right. We have the capability with techniques like this one to create very accurate 3D maps. Um, at very high density as well. I'll come back to that in the end of my talk. Uh, and, and we don't need LiDAR because, because cameras are much cheaper and cost is a huge factor. You know, what's the point of developing a self-driving car if just this LiDAR hardware on the roof of the car is half a million dollars, right? Who's going to buy that car? I, I wouldn't. Anyway. I'll move on. So, so I think there is a value in these camera-based 3D sensing techniques. Um, but now I want to come to the second kind of interesting part of my talk, and that is uh, how can we leverage the power of deep networks to boost the performance of visual SLAM methods? As you know, deep networks have revolutionized computer vision and in fact, all of data analysis and machine learning. Uh, initially, you, you would uh, you know, detect objects and images, but uh, after that, my team and other teams have moved on to show you can do many things with deep networks. For example, in 2015, we published a paper called FlowNet, where we showed that you can train a neural network to predict optical flow from consecutive images just by training it with lots of uh, training data. We, and there's also, for example, uh, this work Signet from the team of uh, Roberto Cipolla. And th th this is an old one. There's obviously much more advanced uh, networks these days for semantic segmentation of the world. But uh, just to show you that starting, you know, after the 2012 paper, there's been subsequent papers to show you can do more. You can do even in a, this is a paper we had at NeurIPS 2016, where we showed that you can train neural networks to predict uh, protein structure, something that is now commonly known under the name of AlphaFold by Google. But this is a 2016 paper where we showed that you can outperform state-of-the-art protein structure prediction from amino acid sequences using deep convolutional networks. Or another paper we had sometime 2018, I think, where we showed that you can do very accurate video object segmentation with suitably uh, trained neural networks. But this is all nice. The question is, how can you port this power of neural networks to the world of 3D reconstruction and SLAM? 
And somehow this is a notorious challenge. You can see it by the fact that many of these papers didn't appear until 2017, so later. Um, and in fact, these initial papers often showed that you can do SLAM and visual odometry with deep networks, but they were typically not state of the art in terms of quantitative performance on established benchmarks. And it's hard to say why exactly the initial approaches were not state of the art, but I believe maybe this idea of just end-to-end -end training, in go the images and out comes the SLAM solution, maybe this is, we're not ready for that yet. And, and, and so sometimes I think there's a lot of understanding about how the 3D world is captured in a camera with the rigid body motion of the camera with the perspective projection onto the sensor. All of that information is there all the way down to the photometric calibration of your camera. And throwing this all overboard and just training a network with training data, I think you lose a lot of valuable knowledge that you have. And so the challenge I think in this field but in general with deep learning nowadays is how to combine deep learning with domain knowledge about the problem at hand. And so this is what we set out to do in this approach that uh, um, together with Nan Yang and collaborators. In fact, it turns out you can train deep networks to predict the depths of the scene. This is, there is one called the mono depths. This one is, I think, uh, same year, uh, Kuznetsov and collaborators, CVPR 17. They showed you can predict the depths from just one single image. And this is quite impressive, but at the same time, not surprising. If I showed you an image and asked you how far are the different things in the scene, you could tell me, right? Because you know the world that you live in. And in a similar fashion, we can train a network to reproduce that, except that networks are typically better when it, or computers are better when it comes to quantitative performance. We built up on this work of Kuznetsov and collaborators in 2018 with a network that we call StackNet. And as you can see, it's even more precise and crisp in terms of the depth predictions. But the most important contribution is not so much this depth prediction, but the contribution in this paper is that we take these depth predictions and feed them into a SLAM algorithm. Basically saying, find a reconstruction such that the depth maps for each keyframe are consistent or as consistent as possible with the deep net predictions. And once you do that, you get a monocular SLAM approach that turns out to be quite on par with top stereo methods. And that's why we call it deep virtual stereo odometry. In retrospect, I think this name was not optimally chosen because most people think it's a stereo method. It's often referred to as a stereo method in papers, but this is actually a monocular method. So this only needs one camera and it's called virtual stereo because it essentially hallucinates the presence of the second camera. And in general, we find that by, by using deep network predictions, we can compensate for missing sensory information. And in fact, this method is what we call semi-supervised or self-supervised in the sense that you basically take the second camera only in training you predict depth so that it's consistent with the second camera intensities. And in applications, you only need one camera. And in fact, here's a comparison. As I mentioned, typically with a monocular approach, you would not be able to estimate the scale. So if you see the ground truth on the top, you see on the left, a very nice, I find, reconstruction uh, of a mono DSO. Uh, except that the scale continuously drifts. And so some structures are smaller, some structures are bigger than in the, in the input, in, in the ground truth. Once you have a stereo system with a known baseline, as I mentioned, that eliminates the scale drift. And so you get a consistent reconstruction here in the middle. But what's nice is this DVSO is a monocular approach that gets qualitatively the same result as the stereo method. In fact, here are some quantitative numbers. The top sequences are the ones we train on. The bottom are the, the, the new sequences. Uh, and here's uh, three top stereo methods, stereo LSD-SLAM, stereo ORP-SLAM, and stereo DSO. 
A stereo LSD slam visual odometry, so we don't include loop closure in here uh, to have a fair comparison. Uh, and the solid numbers are the best performing numbers. Uh, and here in comparison is this uh, DVSO, a monocular method. And as you can see, it can rival with the, with, the, with the stereo approach, even though it only uses one of the two cameras. And in fact, you can go further. <clears throat> this is a, a paper we had at last, last year's uh, CVPR. It's a technique we call D3VO, deep depths, deep pose, and deep uncertainty. Uh, um, and so let me, and, and here, so we do more predictions with deep networks and feed them all into the SLAM approach. In fact, the way we feed it into the SLAM approach is both in the front end tracking in terms of nonlinear factor graphs, where we add it to the factor graphs, uh, these depths, pre these predictions of the deep network, but also in the back end optimization, where in the we expand the classical loss function by additional terms that assure consistency with these predictions. So more specifically, if you have one image, as you saw, you can predict the depths. Once you have two consecutive images, IT and IT prime, you can uh, predict the relative pose between these two uh, methods. And with that, you can actually then train the method in a fully self-supervised approach. And what you do is you basically use the same brightness consistency that we use in these direct methods. You use it as a loss function to train the networks. That's why we call them deep and direct SLAM methods, because it really is using the same photo consistency to drive things. Unfortunately, when you take a real camera, the brightness is not preserved. This is the warped images and you see they're very different because you have these uh, uh, aperture times that can vary exposure times and that, that creates variations in the brightness. The good thing is you can train a network to compensate for that. You can correct with an affine brightness transformation that is also predicted by this network. And that way it not only aligns the images with rigid body motion with respect to rigid body motion, but also with respect to affine brightness correction. And so this looks good, but once again, you carry it into the real world. The real world is not always brightness consistent. It's not a Lambertian world. There is glass structures, there's metallic structures, there's trees, et cetera, that might move. And so from frame to frame, brightnesses will typically not be preserved. This is an issue and it's very difficult to actually model all these phenomena physically to compensate for them. So instead, what's actually much easier is to downweight areas in the image, uh, in this residual where the brightness is likely not preserved. This is often called an aleatoric uncertainty that we can predict with the deep network. And here it is. So after training, you end up with a system that can predict depths, relative camera motion, affine brightness correction, but also an uncertainty for each pixel telling us how likely is the brightness preserved or not. And then with a Gaussian distribution, we can downweight the residuals and to make sure that not everything is downweighted, we have to have this additional log sigma term that comes from the Gaussian distribution. So this way we can train the whole thing in a fully self-supervised manner. And then all these predictions on, at runtime are integrated into the SLAM approach, as I mentioned before. And once you do that, you can evaluate this method. So it's a monocular method. We can check how accurate are the depth predictions. And here's a comparison to what we believed at the time was the state of the art, mono depths two. I think this is a ball from Burgard's lab in Freiburg. <clears throat> and you see, we are significantly better. This is an ablation study, depending on what components you include or don't include, um, um, both on Kitty and on the somewhat more challenging Europe data set where you have often faster motion and often also frames that are very dark, et cetera. A nice thing is it generalizes quite well. So this was trained on Kitty, for example, and still the depth predictions and the uncertainty predictions, say for this window area, are fairly good even on cityscapes. So there is something that can be learned from one data set and that carries over to other data sets. 
Next, let's look at visual odometry. This was our main, main aim after all. Here's a comparison both to classical methods, but also to deep methods or hybrid methods. And again, you see a significant boost in performance that we achieve, even compared to stereo methods like stereo DSO. Yet what's even better is you can compare to a stereo inertial method here, a, a state-of-the-art stereo inertial method called Basalt by Vlad Uzenko and collaborators. And we showed that this monocular G3VO is on par in terms of performance with the stereo inertial method, again, even though it only uses one camera and no inertial sensor. And so again, the message is you can compensate for missing sensory information by deep network predictions that are fed into the framework on various levels. Here's a comparison. This is the mono DSO reconstruction, very noisy because the trajectory is inaccurate. So you get multiple uh, walls, etc. on the right. The reconstruction of D3VO much more crisp because the trajectory is much more consistent. This is one of the Europe data sets. Now, the last part, there's more you can do with deep networks. In fact, I showed you can predict depths. The next question is, can we generate a complete dense reconstruction of the world from just a single moving camera? I showed you we can track a single moving camera at unprecedented precision. We can now, in addition, train a neural network that we call MonoRec, a neural network to generate a dense reconstruction of the world. And this is a network that basically predicts depths, but not for a single frame, but for a sequence of consecutive frames so that we can exploit the brightness consistency across frames for the prediction. So it takes a, a whole so-called cost volume. This is not, we, we didn't invent that idea. So there's other approaches, also deep learning approaches that have used that. But what we in addition propose is a so-called mask module that filters out moving objects in a way that they don't deteriorate the performance. And in a way that we can get reconstructions of the static world, even if there's moving objects in the scene. In fact, without the mask module, it gives nice dense reconstructions, but the moving objects get smeared out over the video. It's also nice to see, but I don't have a video in the talk. And so with the mask module, you can filter out moving objects. It's all elaborated more in the paper and in the associated videos. As I said, you aggregate brightness information from multiple warp frames here in the cost volume, and then you filter out moving objects. And interestingly, you can tap into the same brightness inconsistency to say, okay, since across multiple frames, the brightness is very inconsistent, this is likely a moving object and that way you can filter them out in the same network architecture before you generate a final depth prediction. And then all these depth predictions can be merged, and this is what you see here. It's a dense reconstruction uh, obtained from just one single moving camera. And you can see it's a fairly large scale and colorful dense reconstruction of the world achieved just from one camera. And it highlights again the message that maybe we do not need LiDAR to sense the 3D world because we can get fairly accurate, colored and very dense reconstructions just using cameras. When I say very dense, I don't think you can achieve that level of density in a LiDAR based scanning. And if you want, you get very expensive lighters, because as you know, with lighters, the issue is if you want higher point density, the cost goes up dramatically. With cameras, this is not the case. You know, pixels are cheap after all. Okay, I think I'm gradually running out of time, so I will stop the video here. There's more videos on the net if you are interested. Uh, and I'll come to the conclusion. I talked uh, about SLAM uh, and uh, deep and direct SLAM methods. Uh, I showed you some of the main uh, steps in, in this direction that we took. The, the first kind of large-scale capable monocular real-time SLAM method, LSD SLAM, 
is follow up uh, a successor direct sparse odometry that uh, that uh, optimizes things jointly in a sliding window fashion. So this can be seen as a sliding window photometric bundle adjustment, if you will. And then uh, extensions of these techniques, for example, to stereo, uh, to get scale and to get uh, more precision and robustness. And then I talked about how to leverage the power of deep networks to boost the performance of these methods and really get state-of-the-art performance, for example, for monocular methods, uh, DVSO and D3VO. I showed that you can also leverage deep networks to generate semantic reconstructions like you see here. And lastly, I showed, uh, this is CVPR this year, that you can get generate dense reconstructions from just one single moving camera. That's all. Thank you for your attention, and I'm open to questions. Thank you so much for the Professor Krimers. Uh, I think it's very exciting. So I think we do have questions. I think we can start with the questions online, and then we will start with the in-person questions. So I think the first question is related to the uh, photometric error. So the question will be the, how badly does the presence of a light source or highly reflective surface break the photometric error? Uh, can we recover such scenario in the practical application? That's a good question. Uh, um, as I mentioned in D DSO in particular and in the deep learning based approaches later on, we can explicitly rule out areas where we don't have Lambertian structures. And this works fairly well. So the key challenge somehow in direct methods is the better you can model the brightness variations of your sensor. And this is actually the second contribution in the direct sparse odometry that we use a very accurate photometric calibration of the camera where we where we where we first calibrate the camera response function, the vignetting and all that because the better you understand how your sensor captures the world, the more precision and performance you can get out of it, right? But at some point, the world gets very complicated, especially if you move to a non-Lambertian world, then you have glass, you have metal, you have translucencies, you have reflections, things like that. And Obviously, one can now go ahead and model all these phenomena, and this might be, you know, a, a worthwhile endeavor, but it's very complicated to do, right? And it takes lots of time to compute, you know, BRDFs of the surfaces along with the reconstructions. And we are working on this, and this is a challenge, but a somewhat easier way to handle all of these nuisances is to say it's not necessary that we uh, programmers and researchers understand and model these phenomena, it's sufficient if the deep network understands them and can help us distinguish and alleviate the issue and basically tell us which areas can we rely on brightness consistency and in which areas can we not. Okay, okay, thank you. So I think uh, we also have questions regarding to the deep network. So uh, the question will be the have depth predictions from the networks uh, generalized beyond the data set bias to be useful for any SLAM application. For example, uh, can a SLAM with network trained for the autonomous driving car be the useful for the indoor reconstruction task? So this is a good question. Uh, I should say we explored that to some extent. I showed you numbers, for example, when training on Kitty and applying it on, on other data sets like cityscapes. Now you could argue it's still autonomous driving, so it's still a similar scenario, but there is variations. The cameras are different. The, 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 you know, the architecture of the roads are different. So there is something that is being generalized from one scenario to another. And what I didn't show is we also experimented with uh, completely different scenarios. For example, when we showed DVSO at ECCV, we actually demonstrated that we can also do a handheld, we train it on Kitty, say driving scenarios, but we can take it into the hand and walk through a building and it will still work. 
And so for me at that point, it's not really clear what exactly the system generalizes from, from one scenario to another, but there is a generalization. Um, but we didn't ever quantify that. And so clearly uh, there will be scenarios, for example, if you take a, a system trained in the real world and bring it to a Lego world where everything is scaled differently, then you will not get the correct scale of the world with a monocular approach, right? Because it's trained to, to detect the particular scale. Okay. So there are certain, you know, you can definitely fool the system if you if you're keen on doing that. Okay, thank you. So we also have another question about the D3 wheel. So on D3 wheel, do you use the uncertainty return a bad network for brightness uh, consistency in the slam factor graph framework, for example, as a coherence of a factor or others? <laughs> That's a very, very good question, very detailed question. I hope we do. I cannot say for sure. I'd have to look in the paper. I don't remember. Uh, it's a very good question, though. I will check with the lead author, Nan, to see if, if he did that. But definitely, this is something, you know, once you have uncertainty, you should be using it in the factor graphs as well, obviously. But uh, I must admit, off the top of my head, I don't remember. Ah, OK. <laughs> OK, no problem. So the next uh, question will be the performance of this method aided by the deep neural network. It's, I think uh, it's very uh, impressive. However, for the robots, typically doesn't have strong GPU on board. So uh, how do you solve these problems in the, for the real application? Uh, for the real application, uh, at Artisense, we are working with NVIDIA Jetson. Uh, so this offers an embedded solution that can be ported to at least a number of robots. Now, obviously, this would not fly on a nanocopter, right? So, so if that's your application, then good luck with deep learning, right? <laughs> um, once you have really limited compute power and you can't even include, a, say, an NVIDIA Jetson or something like that, then I think it's a challenge. And there is a lot of research activities trying to, you know, to develop hardware support that would allow more portable uh, application of deep learning. Uh, I should say this is not really my domain, however. So it's, I'm not really an expert on suitable hardware architectures to support deep networks. But there's other uh, approaches. Obviously, once you've trained a network, you can try to compress the network, right? Fit it with a, another network that is of smaller architecture with fewer layers, but ideally generates similar output. So this can be done to compactify networks, to make them more scalable, to make them faster. So there's many, many angles from which you can tackle this, this problem. OK. Uh, I think we can also take questions from Zoom. So if anyone has questions in Zoom, uh, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor. My name is Lucas. I'm on with the Air Lab too. Uh, one thing I liked about your talk is that you talk about how visual can, uh, in the future or in the near future, can su supersede the lidar. Uh, but so recently we we were in the sub T challenge, and we what we observed in sub T challenge application at least that everybody was using every team used a lidar solution. What do you think is currently like the biggest roadblock? That would prevent that prevents a, a, a visual visual only solution to be applied like in a, in the context like the sub T challenge was. I don't know if you if you follow that how it was, but it's it that's the question. If I haven't followed the sub T challenge, sorry, so I wouldn't know what this. Yeah, so so the scenario was basically just go inside a cave, and it's not a really large cave, maybe four hundred mm -hmm. by four hundred, uh, and some narrow tunnels, maybe dark areas, uh, and maybe some fog. But nobody like the, the and in the end you needed to identify artifacts with five meters accuracy. So after all this, you needed to have an accuracy of at least five meters between your object detection and your slim. So, 
So, yeah. so obviously, each sensor has certain limitations, and and you know, if you take if you're uh, operating in the complete dark, for example, then clearly a camera is not useful. Uh, often people say, like for self-driving, how do you handle darkness, right? If you're driving at night. Well, see, the way we handle it there is the same way any sane human does. You switch on the headlights, right? And then the, the world is no longer dark. And in a right. similar fashion, I guess, even if you're in a cave, you could carry a lamp along. Light sources are very cheap as well. So talking about cost, you know, the light source is not going to really increase cost significantly. Um, Cost is an issue, not in all areas, right? I mean, if you have just one robot and you can put a lot of money into it, then do so, right? Then put a lighter, no, sure. But in the automotive field, we've worked with automotive companies all the way going back to 2005 when I started working with Daimler. And I remember the first collaboration with Daimler, we had installed one camera in the car. And when I said, can we add a second camera? The manager at Daimler said, no. He said, it's too expensive. The second camera was too expensive. A camera that cost three euro, right? In a car that cost 50,000 euro. So I was a little bit puzzled when I heard that uh, response. But then I learned cost cutting is a huge aspect if you want to, if you want to, you know, in, in, this, in this commercial world. The cost plays an enormous factor and you would be surprised how much. These three euro for the extra camera was too much at the time. I don't know what that same manager says about all the lighters people are putting out, because these don't cost three euro, they cost thousands of euros, right? So it depends on what system you're looking at, but if you want a system that is scalable, that can be mass produced, then cost plays a role. Now the question, why do people not move to cameras? Well, the truth is a lot of the techniques I've been showing you emerged, you can check for yourself in the last five or six years, right? So, so, so it hasn't been so very long. And so, whereas LiDAR-based SLAM has been around for, for decades, right? All the way going, going back to the works of uh, Borga, Troon, and, and Dieter Fox and many others, right? This is, one can say, decades old technology. And typically, technologies take years to get into industry. But you know, we are publishing. We are putting all our code on the net to, to accelerate the transition and to make sure these things end up in the real world. And talking about LiDAR versus camera, this is an endless story. But a lot of the, the, the limitations of cameras turn out to be also limitations of LiDAR. For example, rain, right? Lighters do not work well in the rain. The, the, the laser beam gets refracted in a single uh, raindrop. That's a disaster. Our camera systems have no problem with rain, right? We switch on the windshield wipers and the rain is gone, right? And we demo that we get almost the same precision in the rain as we do in regular. And in snow and Fog is an issue, yeah, but fog is also an issue for the LiDAR, right? So, so, so there are not so many cases where the LiDAR really has a benefit over the camera. The main one that I can think of is if you're in the darkness and for whatever reason, you're not allowed to switch on the light. Right? <laughs> then, yeah, then LiDAR is better, right? But when does that ever happen? Okay. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm, I'm, personally, I'm going to do a lot of... I'm, I'm, I think my my research is going to go towards the, the camera and less of that the is great. I'm happy I convinced. <laughs> but, one yeah, on, on, on sub T, we definitely <laughs> we definitely had a, a lot of camera a lot of lights turned on because we needed object detection anyway to find exactly the right. That's the other thing, right? Once you have a camera, you can detect objects with a lighter. If there is a sign with some writing on it, you can scan it as much as you want. You won't be able to read it, right? With cameras, you know, somehow the world we live in is made for the eyes, or more specifically, the eyes are made for the world by evolution, right? If eyes were no good, we wouldn't have eyes, right? This, this world is made for eyes and for cameras. And so, and even 3D sensing can be done. Humans do it all the time. And so machines obviously can also do it. Okay, I think that we can also have another questions from Zoom. So yeah, if you have questions, please go ahead.
maybe if if there's no question right now, I, I see the times gradually okay. coming to an end. Let me make a short announcement. We okay. are very much looking for postdocs in this field, for researchers in general, but in particular for postdocs. And as you can see, we have a great uh, set of technologies. And, and so uh, we're very keen on having people join us. Or if you just want to come, say, as a visiting PhD student or whatever, please reach out to us. Munich is, is a wonderful place to live, uh, amazing city, landscape, everything. You see a bit of the town in the background. The Alps are nearby, but also the university is a great university. And so it's a wonderful research environment. If you, if you would consider it maybe for, a, for an exchange visit or whatever, please reach out to me, send me an email and we can see where we can go. Okay, cool, cool, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we can stop over here since we are already over time. So thanks so much for the Professor Kramers for this awesome presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank and you, also, Shibo. Okay, thanks. and uh, thank you everyone for joining us and have a nice day. Thanks everyone, it's been a pleasure. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.